Play It Today, Lesson 34. We've already looked at the difference between the basic, major and minor chords, back in lessons 21 and 23. Now, it's time to go into the difference between major and minor scales. The first point to make is that there are in fact some very strong resemblances between the two types of scale. They've actually got quite a lot in common. Just like a major scale, a minor scale consists of a sequence of eight notes covering a whole octave. And minor and major scales share the same key signatures. Any key signature that fits a major scale will fit a minor scale as well. On the first page of your booklet for this lesson, page 397, you can see how two scales with the same key signature, one major and the other minor, relate to one another. The scale of A minor has the same key signature as C major, that is, no sharps or flats. If you play the notes of the C major scale, all the white keys in other words, but beginning with A instead of C, you get the scale of A minor, like this. In the same way, play the notes of the G major scale, but starting with E instead of G, and you've got the scale of E minor. E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D, E. E flat major has the same key signature as C minor, three flats. So we play the notes of the E flat major scale starting on C. C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. And this gives us the scale of C minor. Major and minor keys with the same key signature are called a relative major and minor. So A minor is the relative minor of C major. E minor is the relative minor of G major, and so on. Now, you may be thinking, if A minor and C major have the same notes, then where exactly is the difference between them? Well, you can see that for yourself at the bottom of page 397. A minor scale is different from a major scale because the sequence of tones and semitones is different. You know that a major scale always has two tones, a semitone, three more tones and another semitone. That fixed order of tones and semitones is what makes it a major scale. In a minor scale, the sequence is different. A tone, a semitone, two tones, another semitone and two more tones. So, although A minor and C major have the same notes, their sequences of tones and semitones are quite different. Once your ear is attuned to it, you can tell a major scale from a minor scale immediately just by listening. They don't sound the same at all. Notice that the interval between the first and third degrees of a minor scale is always a minor third, one and a half tones, instead of a major third, two whole tones. Now, there is unfortunately a complication with the minor scale. When a piece is written in a minor key, it isn't usually based on the straightforward minor scale that we've just met. Instead, it's based on either the harmonic minor or the melodic minor scale. You can see these two variants on the minor scale on page 398 of your booklet. Let's hear all three forms of the minor scale now, using A minor as our example. First, the basic A minor scale, all the white keys from A to A. Now here's the harmonic minor version of the same scale, with the seventh degree raised by a semitone, G sharp instead of G. And finally, the melodic minor version of the A minor scale, with both the sixth and seventh degrees raised a semitone, 
F sharp and G sharp. It's important to realize that the key signature for the harmonic and melodic versions of the minor scale remains the same as for the ordinary minor scale. The changes to the sixth and seventh degrees of the scale appear as accidentals in the music, not as part of the key signature. And it's also worth reminding yourself that you don't necessarily need a sharp sign to raise a note by a semitone. Take a look at the C minor scale at the bottom of page 398. With a key signature of B, E and A flat, in its basic form it sounds like this. To change this C minor scale into its melodic minor version, we need to raise the 6th and 7th degrees by a semitone each. The 6th degree is A flat, so to raise it a semitone, we put a natural sign in front, making it into plain A. And we do the same with the B flat, which is the 7th degree of the scale. Making a flat into a natural raises a note by a semitone, just as a sharp does. Let's hear the result. C melodic minor. You may well feel that this is all a bit much to take in at one go. The answer is to take your time. Try playing through all the minor scales. Their key signatures are listed with the major scales on page 399. You should find it easy enough to work out the notes. For instance, you can see that B minor has two sharps, like D major. So the B minor scale is B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, A, and back to B. To make the harmonic minor, change the A on the seventh degree of the scale to A sharp. And for the melodic minor, turn the G into a G sharp as well. If you work through all the minor scales, playing their melodic and harmonic versions as well, you'll begin to familiarize yourself with them thoroughly. This is important, because in the end it's just as vital to know the minor scales as the major scales. Before we move on, there's one more question to answer. If major and minor keys share the same key signature, how do you tell which key a piece is in, whether it's in C major or A minor? D major or B minor, and so on. If you read through the text in your booklet from the bottom half of page 399 to the end of page 400, you'll pick up some useful tips for distinguishing major keys from the relative minor. When you've read this carefully, why not look back to some earlier lessons of Play It Today and try to work out whether the main pieces of music are in major or minor keys. In fact, you'll probably find that with a bit more experience, you'll begin to pick out the difference between major and minor by ear, simply by listening carefully. You'll find that they do sound quite distinct. Our solo piece for this lesson is a prelude by Chopin in E minor. The key signature is F sharp, and you'll notice that the piece both begins and ends with the notes of the E minor chord. E, G, and B. The prelude is marked to be played largo, slow, and con espressione, with expression or feeling. Let's listen to it now.
You'll have noticed that in order to get the right expression into his playing of this very emotional prelude, the pianist allows himself a lot of freedom with the speed of the piece. Instead of keeping to an inflexible beat, like a metronome, he holds back or speeds up some of the phrases, so as to emphasise the emotional climaxes. You'll probably find that this comes quite naturally when you get into the feel of the music, and your only problem will be keeping this effect of rubato, as it's called, under control. You must never altogether lose the underlying sense of rhythm, even if you do bend it a little. It's very important not to play the left-hand chord staccato. When you're repeating the same chord, for instance, right through bar one, try not to lift your fingers from the keys at all. You should be able to release the keys enough to be able to press down again for the next chord without your fingertips ever actually losing contact with the keyboard. Try it and see how it works. If your keyboard instrument is a piano, you'll find that the use of the sustaining pedal will help a lot. In general, this prelude isn't too difficult a piece, but you'll need to read the notes carefully because there are so many accidentals. Notice the G double sharp in bar 16, which is of course the same as A natural. Follow the fingering carefully. In bar 12, you have to play a D sharp with your fourth finger and then take over the note with your thumb so that your second finger is free to play the following F sharp. This rather tricky fingering is needed to keep the phrase absolutely smooth. You'll soon work out how the demi semiquavers fit in, in bar 16, and the triplets in bars 12 and 18. Above all, be sure to play this prelude with real feeling. On pages 403 and 404 of your booklet, you'll find two new chords introduced, the augmented fifth and the diminished seventh. The augmented fifth is the chord that appears on the third degree of the harmonic minor scale and the diminished seventh chord occurs on the seventh degree of the same scale. As you can see on page 403, an augmented fifth chord is made up of two major thirds, one on top of the other. Another way of looking at it is to say that an augmented fifth chord is a basic three-note major chord with the fifth raised by a semitone. For instance, C, E, G is the chord of C major, so C, E, G sharp is the C augmented fifth chord. It sounds like this. It's the interval between the root note and the fifth, for example, C to G sharp, that gives the chord its name, an augmented fifth. In fact, there are three types of interval of a fifth. The perfect fifth, like C to G or D to A, the augmented fifth, C to G sharp, or D to A sharp, and the diminished fifth, C to G flat, D to A flat, and so on. The interval of a perfect fifth lives up to its name by sounding very stable and complete in itself. The augmented fifth is a more discordant, uncomfortable interval. And here are some examples of diminished fifths. The interval of a diminished fifth crops up in the diminished seventh chord. This chord consists of three minor thirds, or to put it another way, a minor third, a diminished fifth, and a diminished seventh. Let's hear an example. Just as there are three types of interval of a fifth, so there are three intervals of a seventh. The major seventh, the minor seventh and the diminished seventh. Examples of these intervals are given at the top of page 404. Major sevenths, 
C to B, D to C sharp and so on, are only a semitone below an octave. Minor sevenths are lowered another semitone, C to B flat, D to C and so on. And diminished sevenths come down yet another semitone, C to B double flat, D to C flat and so on. All the augmented fifth and diminished seventh chords are listed in the summaries on page 404. You may be surprised at first that there are so few of them. In fact, there's a very simple and yet rather fascinating reason for this. Each inversion of an augmented fifth chord is the root position of another augmented fifth. So the first inversion of the C augmented fifth chord, E, G sharp and C, is the root position of the E augmented fifth chord. And the second inversion, G sharp, C and E, is the root position of G sharp augmented fifth. There are, in all, only four completely different augmented fifth chords. With the diminished seventh chord, the position is even more dramatic. Here, there are only three completely different chords. The three inversions of the C diminished seventh chord, for instance, give the root positions of the E flat, F sharp and A diminished chords. Take the time to play through and familiarise yourself with the augmented fifth and diminished seventh chords. You'll never really be able to produce your own music freely until you know your chords thoroughly. And these are among the most important ones of all to grasp. It's well worth the effort. Now we're going to look at two Latin American dances, the rumba and the samba. Here's the most basic rumba rhythm. And a slightly more complicated two-handed version. You can hear how the rumba rhythm cuts across the normal four beats to a bar of 4-4 time to give an interestingly syncopated effect. Let's listen to example A. It's in the key of D minor with a B-flat key signature. Now, another interpretation of these eight bars, with notes from the chords added to the right-hand part, making the music somewhat richer in tone. With both hands playing the accompaniment, the rumba could sound like this. Rumba rock is a more modern variation on the basic rumba. The right hand plays the chords as repeated quavers, accented to fit in with the rumba rhythm kept going by the left hand and the bass. Of course, the repeated quaver chords can be played with the left hand 
leaving the right hand free to play a melody over the top. The samba is always written in 2-2 two -two time, two minim beats to the bar. But we're going to count the basic rhythms in 4-4 four -four time first, just to make it clearer how it goes. Here's rhythm A on page 406. And rhythm B. Example B is a samba theme in the key of A minor, although it begins with a G major chord. Now, here's a two-handed accompaniment for that theme using rhythm A. Using rhythm B as an accompaniment only, with alternating tonic and dominant bass notes in the left hand and repeated chords in the right, we get this. A famous version of this samba accompaniment, which includes augmented fifth chords, is the last example on page 406. Sambando, our piece with backing group for this lesson, is the full version of the samba in example B on page 406. The first problem to tackle is finding your way around the various repeats in the music. Let's just run through them quickly. The first two bars are played three times, so that altogether this introductory section where you just play along with the accompaniment lasts a total of eight bars. Then comes the tune that you've already met in example B. This is played twice. The second time, skipping over the bars marked 1, straight on to the bar marked 2. Next comes a rather dramatic section that goes on until the second to last line of music. Here, you fade into the accompaniment again for 16 bars. The first two bars in that line are marked to be played seven times, so that with the two that follow, that makes 16. Then, go back to the repeat sign at the start of line 4 of the music. Play through again to the end of line 8. And finally, jump to the coda for the last 8 bars. Obviously, you need to get the hang of all this before you can begin to get to grips with the music. So, let's listen to the whole of Sambando now with keyboard and backing. Follow the written music as you listen to the cassette, taking note of all the repeats. Try counting the repeated bars at the start and in the second to last line, where there's no tune to help you keep in time. You'll probably need to hear the piece through several times before you find your way correctly. Sambando.
The right-hand part in Sambando is quite tricky in itself, and you should certainly practice it independently of the left hand. Be careful you read the accidentals correctly, and remember the influence of a sharp or flat sign lasts for a whole bar unless there's a natural sign to contradict it. Make sure you bring out the syncopated rhythms indicated by the accent or stress marks in the central section of the music. If you imitate the keyboard on the cassette, you won't go far wrong. You'll need to get the left-hand part thoroughly practiced so that you can play it almost automatically before you try it together with the right hand. In theory, you can keep up the same left-hand pattern we used in example B from beginning to end of Sambando, except here and there where you're instructed to stop playing with the left hand, at the E7 chord in the first line of music, for instance. In practice, though, it's very difficult to keep that left-hand rhythm going through the middle section of the piece, lines 4 to 8 of the music. It's probably best here just to play minim bass notes in the left hand like the left-hand part of the accompaniment using rhythm B on page 406. Altogether, it's a matter of common sense. Listening to your own playing, deciding how you like it, putting in a left-hand part that you can manage successfully and that sounds right to you. But, one word of warning, you must get the chords right. There are a mixture of major and minor chords, E minor and E major, D minor and D major, A minor and A major. Whatever you do, don't get them confused, or you'll make a horribly discordant noise. All in all, Sambando isn't particularly easy, but it is great fun. Let's hear the backing now without the keyboard part. <laughs> Finally, on page 408, you'll find all the major seventh chords sent out for you. You can play through these at your leisure and refer to this table whenever you may have forgotten any particular chord. <laughs> 